the message today is one that has absolutely touched me in, in a way that uh, very few messages have ever touched my life. And I saw myself in it, not proud that I did, but I did. Brother Evan, who is our youth director, shared with me on Thursday night a dream that he had Monday night. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want him to share that dream because it is a dream that is 100% right on. It is where we are. It is what's about to happen. And uh, maybe if they would hear what he has to say and what happened to this precious young man of the Lord, maybe it will affect some people more than anything I could ever say uh, or that I've tried to say. But I want you to hear. Won't you welcome Brother Evan? Brother Evan, where are you, honey? Come on. Brother Evan Minor, come on. Come on down. We didn't catch him off guard. We let him, we warned him this morning a little tad. <laughs> Just a little tad. Didn't give him a choice, of course. <laughs> but let him know. Uh, Evan, it really, really, really touched me. And the Lord said it will touch many people and that he had, he himself had given you this dream. So, if you'll come share it, honey. Just share all of it. So, Monday night, I had a dream. We were all in the middle of service on a Sunday morning. The praise team, they were singing, whose report shall you believe? They were all singing and everyone was smiling, everyone was smiling, just singing, praising God, looking around. And then when some people looked back, to this, back on stage, the entire praise team was gone. And as they looked and they saw that the praise team was gone, they all had a look of shock. And the screens went black, both of the screens on our sides. And everyone was thinking, did, did, did that really just happen? Did, the, did, did, did we just get left behind? And you see everyone just having a sense of shock on their faces. And then a few moments later, it really set into them. We've been left behind. And after they were left behind, they were wondering what they were supposed to do. And one of them came forward and they got together about the middle section right up here. And they had a small group together. And they were just praying to God and reading the book of Revelations and being prepared for what's about to happen. And I would say about 20% of the sanctuary, 20 30% was what was left behind. And that's about it. Of this sanctuary. Yes, ma'am. Of this, of this sanctuary. About 20 to 30% of the crowd here was left behind. And everyone else had gone up. Thank you so much. <laughs> I wanted you to understand that the Lord said, have him share that. And the Lord had given it to him. And that, again, uh, it was a dream referencing this church. Not, in it, not across the nation, not anywhere else. This church and what happened in this church when the rapture took place. Today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about spiritual landmines. Spiritual landmines are the most important spiritual landmine that there is. That's actually the one I will be addressing Two weeks ago, a terrorist crossed the northern border into Israel and planted a landmine. And within hours, an unsuspecting Israeli citizen stepped on that landmine and was killed. Landmines, the Lord said, are one of the most destructive weapons that's ever used in wartime. It is a device designed to cripple or kill whomever triggers it. It is a hidden danger which makes it all the more treacherous and today in Israel there are still some landmines in the north, relics of the 1973 war. Still active ones there. The IDF, the IDF soldiers have to be extremely cautious when defending the Galilee for it's in that area that the most landmines have been found, but there's always the fear 
that they are more hidden in the overgrown grasses that are around that area. And if you discover it by stepping on it, it's too late. <laughs> well, that is an issue in Israel as well as in parts of Africa. There is a greater danger, the Lord said, that all of us must be aware of. And he called it spiritual landmines. Planted by demonic forces with the goal of damaging or destroying our walk with God Almighty. The devil's landmines are not about harming or about injuring your body, but rather they're in, intended to injure your soul, to ruin your testimony, to devastate your relationship, and to cause you to self-destruct. It is so important that we learn how to identify spiritual landmines and how to protect ourselves from them. And we begin in Daniel 4, which talks about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which no one could interpret, if you remember, book of Daniel. Immediately after Daniel interpreted that dream, he said this to King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. But then what did the king do? And this is his response, Daniel 4 again. Twelve months later, after that event, twelve months later, he was taken, King Nebuchadnezzar, was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. Now, the Lord said that this was one of the most egotistical and prideful statements that you will find in the Bible anywhere. It's a profound revelation of the most dangerous and destructive landmine planted by our enemy and the enemy of our souls. It is called pride. Why then is pride so dangerous and destructive? Because of all the landmines the enemy can plant in the course of your life, this one is the most deceptive and usually the most difficult for any of us really to identify. Particularly, personally, we don't identify. First of all, we don't like the idea of someone thinking that we're prideful, so we're quick to identify that it has any hold on us at any point, at any place. Therefore, you and I are the very last ones to identify what's happening in our lives. So what is pride? Pride is an overemphasis on ourselves. It is a distorted view of who we are, an exaggerated idea of our own importance. It's seeing ourselves through carnal eyes rather than how the Lord sees us. Now, I don't mind telling you because if ever there was a time to be honest, it's when you're delivering this message. <laughs> this message, I told the Lord, I don't like this message. I mean, this message, as I go along, I really didn't like it. And it really, really bothered me. I mean, not for you. It bothered me for me. Amen. Things I did not see. And then to see how the Lord saw it and my understanding, the shortness of time and some of the things we will be sharing even tomorrow night about the shortness of time were extremely frightening to me and really scary to be honest. It's all about pride. It's all about what I think, what I want, what I feel. It's living like the world just revolves around you, me. But what is God 
attitude toward pride. Real simple. He hates it. We all know that, but I'll assure you, you'll see it totally different. You'll see a depth you never thought was even existing before this message is over. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, The Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. In plain English, that means the proud are repulsive and totally obnoxious to God. That's a scary thought. Now I want to remind you, I did not do this message. I simply, you know, am delivering what he gave everything about it. Church, anything that God hates should not be found in us. So why then does God hate pride? Several reasons, but the fundamental one is this. Pride is the chief characteristic of Satan. The prophet Isaiah, speaking of Satan, writes this in Isaiah. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north, and I will climb to the highest heavens, and I'll be like the Most High. The theme of humility and the ugliness of pride runs like a thread throughout the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Proverbs 11, 2. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 29. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will attain honor. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before fall. You see, church, Pride breeds all kinds of sin and all manner of sin. People will lie, cheat, steal, and even murder because of pride. Every other sin that you and I may commit reflects a need we think we have. For example, we lie in order to be accepted or to protect ourselves from a rebuke But pride says, I don't need anything. I don't need anybody. I can take care of myself just fine. Pride actually is the anthem of a two-year-old who argues to his mother, I can do it myself. Pride is the egotism of self-centeredness, selfishness, and self-sufficiency. When the truth is that not one of us is self-sufficient, we all need the Lord. So what causes us to be prideful? There are three main issues we're going to look at. Number one, what causes us to be prideful? Consciously or subconsciously, we really do think the world revolves around us. It's so easy to be self-centered, isn't it? To be so wrapped up with your own life that our thinking does not naturally turn toward anybody else or anybody else's concerns. We're centered on us. We're more concerned. We're still talking about causes. We're more concerned with what people think about us than what God Almighty thinks about us. Pride serves as a cover-up for our feelings of inferiority. Pride is a sign of immaturity. It can arise when a person is given an opportunity or position that they're not ready for. Sometimes people are pushed ahead before they're ready, and the devil will absolutely clobber them with pride 
if they're not spiritually ready to handle both the praise and the criticism that accomplishes, goes along with the company's every single position. Then pride can cause us to believe and enjoy all those nice things that other people say about us. We'll waste time going over them in our minds, you know, as if accomplishments were our own doings. Whether we're singing or whether we're teaching, speaking to one person or to a hundred or more, when we depend on that to feel good about ourselves, we're stepping on a satanic landmine. I want to remind you, Brother Hagin said a long time ago, praise should not make your day and criticism should not ruin it. And another nugget you might want to write down. The devil preys on your words rather than your intent. Now understand this. There's nothing wrong with graciously accepting the approval or affirmation from someone else that they give you. Nothing wrong with that. You know, the devil always takes you and makes you where you can't even, he, you know, he, he just can't hit a balance. I mean, the devil's going to take you far to this way or far the other way. But when it becomes a problem is when we love it. We're talking about when people, you know, give affirmations to us. The problem becomes is when we love it. It's when we glory in it. When we think we can't live without it. When we find ourselves fishing, trying to get somebody to give us a compliment. Our words of affirmation and attention. Don't think it doesn't happen. It does happen. And it's not just the person sitting next to you. Right. <laughs> Y'all are a little slow on that one. <laughs> Another reason we become prideful is that we forget this important truth. Everything you have, every talent, every skill, your personality, your intelligence, everything you have has come to you by a gift yes. from your heavenly Father yes. through the agency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You did nothing to get it Amen. at all. Amen. So if you think you're so cute, it's because the Lord made you cute. <laughs> you should thank Him. It is only by the atoning death and life-giving resurrection of Jesus that we've been forgiven. Yes. And we can walk in holiness and righteousness. Yes. Pride and holiness can't even sit in the same room. Yes. Amen. Wow. The minute you think you're self-sufficient, pride marches in because we're failing to recognize our desperate need for Jesus every moment of the day. We think we know how to do things and kind of just tune into him ever so often. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that your every breath is a gift from God? Yes. Oh, we say it, but we don't dwell on it. <coughs> you couldn't be even sitting here listening to me this morning if God was not sustaining you, Amen. not allowing you to be here. And not making sure that you were here so you would hear this. Sometimes we get selective. We'll acknowledge we need God when there's too much month left at the end of the money. <laughs> or when we don't know how to handle our children or our grandchildren. We really think we need to call on God then. Or we just got laid off from a job. In those crises moments, God seems to be bigger in our lives than he is on a regular day-to-day -day right. thing. But in our day-to-day -day life, we carry on sometimes like we got it all together. Mm -hmm. Just look at your life. You ain't got nothing together. <laughs> Amen. 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 
Church, the truth is that we need God all the time, and we need him for everything. Why do you think God's mercies are new every morning and not just once a week or a month? Because every day. Yet how many of us remember to thank God for them every day? For the mercies that he assigned to you for that day. It becomes a self-conscious pride, a habit of self-sufficiency that causes us to forget to be thankful. Listen to me, church. If there's any area of your life where you think you don't need God, you, my friend, are walking in pride. And the Bible guarantees you are on a path to some kind of failure because the Word says pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before fall. I'll say it again. We cannot afford to love what God hates. And we must not tolerate in ourselves the consequences of pride. So we just talked about the causes of pride. God hates pride because pride is a declaration that you don't need him. And that's the way he sees it. So let's now talk about the consequences of pride. What are the consequences of pride in our life? Pride hinders our relationship with the Lord and blocks his desire to even help us. You can't expect God's blessings if you think you don't need him. Now you might say, I know I need Jesus, but be honest with yourself this morning. Is your utter dependency on the Lord so real that it hovers over everything you think, say, and do? Or do you live much of your life by routine? Just doing what you do? Because it's what you do. Right. Handling life in your own strength, except for the big things. Are you too proud to be a servant to your brothers and sisters? Too proud? to lay self aside to help another, especially when it's inconvenience and it disrupts your plans and your little whatever you have on your little chart for the day. Jesus came as one to serve, he said in Luke 22. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I'm among you as one who serves. So another thing, a consequence of pride, not only makes you so, you blocks the, the whole desire of God to even bless you. That's scary. Yeah. Amen. Another one is pride hinders our relationship with other people. There's not any of us here who's not made a mistake in your life. But when we are prideful, we stop learning from each other. Some people have made so many mistakes, they're proud of their mistakes. In other words, if you say, you have no idea what I've done, let me show what Jesus has done. You can't wait to even hear them say what God has done in their life. You're too busy to tell them what he's done in your life. What you are sure is bigger than what he did in their life. So if you and I become so prideful that we think we're so smart, so intelligent, so clever, that we don't need anybody else's help, or we don't need anybody's advice, sooner or later, you're going to hit a landmine. And it's going to blow up on you. We all need someone we can talk to, someone who can ask you questions and you give them an honest answer. Somebody you can trust to be honest Amen. with you and you can be honest with them. They're hard to find. 
you find them, hold them tight. Amen. That's why we read in the word Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there's victory. Amen. You may say, I pray, I hear God. Well, I hope you do. But nobody has all the answers. We all need somebody in our lives who can caution us, who's looking out for us, who's watching our blind side, because we all have a blind side. And we never know when the enemy is going to slip in on our blind side and lay down a landmine. Prideful people demand unquestioning submission and express hostility when things don't go their way, thereby damaging the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Pride actually makes a person rigid and intolerant of others who may conduct their affairs differently. They're critical, for example, church. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your church, but there's something very wrong if you look down on other churches as inferior to your church. The third thing that pride will do, it hurts your testimony. Prideful people are given to complaining and they live in a general state of discontent. Something's always wrong somewhere all the time. The Bible teaches that true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. But the Apostle Paul knew it didn't come easy, so he wrote in Philippians 4:11, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Our testimony is one of our most important possessions. It's an important part of glorifying God. If instead we take credit for things, we do our goals we achieve, we just rob glory that actually belongs to God and God alone. Amen. And if a pride that fears the face of man stops us from sharing the gospel, is it any wonder that God hates pride? Psalms 115.1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. You might be thinking, can I be proud of getting a promotion at my job? No. But you can be thankful that the Lord has blessed you with that promotion. You see the difference? Giving glory to the Lord rather than pumping yourself up. So I just outlined consequences of pride. Buckle up for this one. What are the evidences of pride? This part just, the Lord actually said buckle up. Buckle up for this one. Here's our checklist. Do you think of yourself as more spiritual than others in your church? Are you quick to find fault with others and to verbalize those thoughts to others? Do you have a sharp, critical tongue? Do you frequently correct or criticize your spouse, your pastor, or other people in positions of leadership? All of these mean you've got a pride issue. Are you driven to receive approval, praise, or acceptance from others? 
Do you take credit for what someone else has done? Are you argumentative? Generally thinking your way is the right way and the only way or it's the best way. Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? Are you easily offended? Do you easily get your little feelings hurt? We're dealing with a pride issue that the Lord says reminds him of Satan. Do you have a hard time admitting that you're wrong? Do you find it difficult to apologize? Do you have a hard time expressing spiritual needs because you're so spiritual you don't want anybody to even know you have a need spiritually? Do you become defensive when you're corrected? And he said you should be thankful for correction. It matures you. Do you talk too much, especially about yourself? You having a good time, church? <laughs> Do you resent being asked or expected to serve your family or your fellow disciples in the church? Because you got things you want to do. Do you have a hard time being told what to do? That means you have a hard time with authority, which is a pride issue. Everything I'm naming is pride. Do you complain often? Do you worry excessively about your reputation? Do you avoid certain events because you fear being embarrassed if you go? Do you find it difficult to be genuinely pleased at the success or prosperity of other people? Do you love being prominent, the center of attention? I couldn't have even made these all up, you understand? I mean, I just, you understand why I said the Lord, I don't like this message. Are you overly self-conscious about your appearance? Finally, are you sitting here thinking how many of these questions apply to somebody you know? <laughs> yeah, the Lord is, he knows. I didn't write one word. I wrote not one word of this message. And we aren't through. Are you feeling pretty good that surely none of these signs of pride really apply to you? <laughs> Church, we cannot tolerate what God hates. He's coming. His promises to the humble are many. Here are just a few of them. 2 Samuel 22. You rescue the humble, but your eyes watch the proud and humiliate them. Psalms 138.6. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Psalm 149.4. For the Lord delights in his people, he crowns the humble with victory. Matthew eleven twenty three. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Amen. Ephesians 4, 2. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Amen. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. We looked at 
causes of pride, consequences of pride, evidences of pride. When all is said and done, here's the bottom line. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Pride is as destructive in the spirit as a landmine is on the battlefield. I close with this little verse from Micah, Micah 6, 8. No, old people, in other words, Michael was saying, do you want, can I do sacrifices? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do the other? And then Micah, and the Lord says, no, old people. The Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Watch out for spiritual landmines. Pride and holiness cannot live in the same place. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Humility is a choice, a choice to be like him. Pride is a choice to participate in the chief characteristic of Satan. 